Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, hi, my name is Brittany. I am a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. Much of the content that I create on here is educational. I've even completed already an entire boards prep series here on this channel, like maybe a year back. As you may know, I've also collaborated with Archer in the past and I did both total AANP and ANCC reviews for them as well. So I've taken back to my material again. I revamped it once more. Uh, this time though, when I present it, it's gonna be a little bit different as I'm delivering this review course entirely on my own once again, but this time I'm using both YouTube and Patreon. So the first lecture here is all about the musculoskeletal system in regards to the nurse practitioner board's exam. However, this video is a shortened version. To get total access to this video and the complete audio files for the nurse practitioner licensing exam, then go ahead and follow the link in the description below that will take you to my Patreon. The total review course, this will launch on February 27th. That's when all of the material will be available in which you pay a monthly access fee. So please enjoy this video here. This is free, obviously, here on YouTube. It'll help you study. And then if you want to access the complete video and the total audio, audio files, then make sure to go ahead and become a Patreon and join my tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Again, that complete course will not be fully launched until February 27th. I just wanna make sure that I can give you guys, you know, a sneak peek of what's to come because I've been working so hard on this and I'm excited as ever to help you guys pass your licensing exam. All right, so whew, without further delay, why don't we just dive right into the skeletal system for the nurse practitioner board's exam. All right, so first up, let's talk about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the elderly populations. Now it is more common in women than it is in men, but there are still reported, reportedly over 8 million men in the U.S. alone that do have osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is characterized by low bone mass, structure disruption, and increased skeletal fragility. So this all together accumulates and results in decreased bone strength and an increased risk of therefore a bone fracture. Osteoporosis itself has no clinical manifestations until there's an actual fracture that does occur. Patients do not come in feeling symptomatic of this. Instead, a possible scenario is that a patient presents with a fracture and the supposed traumatic event that occurred prior to doesn't really match the injury. This is more in line with the type of scenario that would occur with a patient that has osteoporosis. In patients that we diagnose with osteoporosis, treatment is going to be indicated for them. And so of course we want to figure out how we officially diagnose these patients. So clinical, a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis can be made in the presence of a fragility fracture so particularly those occur at reported spine, hip, wrist, humerus, rib, or pelvis. Those are the most reported sites with a fragility fracture. And so exactly what defines a fragility fracture? The definition is that a fragility fracture is a fracture that occurs either spontaneously or from minor trauma. So kind of how I was talking about the typical or a potential scenario of a, pa of a patient presenting with a fracture and the trauma though was very minor. It just doesn't seem to add up. Another method for a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis is by using a dual energy x-ray and then calculating a person's T-score. And so a T-score is gonna be really important for you to be familiar with going into your board's exam and what that means. So a T-score measures a person's bone density and it com they compares it to a healthy adult's bone density of that same gender. So the T-score itself, it represents a number of standard deviations that the patient's score is above or below whatever their average is for their gender. So a T-score of negative 2.5 or less 
that indicates osteoporosis and that's, that's an important number to tuck into your brain. A T-score of negative 2.5 or less indicates osteoporosis. This means that their T-score is 2.5 standard deviations below the average of what we would expect. Of another note, there's so a T-score of a negative one to 2.5, this indicates osteopenia. So another good number to tuck into your brain, a T-score of negative one to 2.5 indicates osteopenia. Osteopenia is also known as reduced bone mass. However, it's just a less severe form than osteoporosis. And it's important to know that if a patient has osteopenia based on their T-score and they have a risk for fracture, they are also indicated to get treatment for that as well. So it's important to know how it's important to know if your patient is at a high risk for a fracture. And there's a really easy to use tool called the Fracture Risk Assessment Tool, um, also sometimes referred to as just FRAX, F-R-A-X. And this calculates for you your patient's risk for a fracture in the next 10 years. And so it's a really useful tool and I definitely recommend that you go ahead and check it out and it helps to evaluate your patient and their risk factors. So risk factors include advanced age, history of fracture, glucocorticoid therapy, um, if they're parental, if they have a parental history of a hip fracture, if they have low body weight, if they're current cigarette smokers, if they have excessive alcohol consumption, or rheumatoid arthritis. All of those are risk factors for a fracture. So if you in, if you determine that your patient does have osteoporosis or if they do have osteopenia and these risk factors, then like I said, we should be treating these patients. So it's important to be familiar with how you would treat these patients. So as always with anything we're managing, we always want to talk about lifestyle measures. That is a foundational plan of care. So things like um, avoiding tripping and falling and avoiding malnutrition, that's going to be really important. Also sufficient intake of both calcium and vitamin D. Vitamin D. Uh, regular exercise, smoking cessation if they're smokers, uh, avoidance of heavy alcohol use, all of these are going to be very important components to managing our patients with osteoporosis or osteopenia and with high risk factors. For pharmacological therapy, we have the bisphosphonates, and for example, the alendronate or risdronate. Those are the most frequently used. I, I see alendronate more commonly. And what these drugs do is they work to reduce bone breakdown and they slow down the activity of osteoclast cells. Osteoclast cells, those work to break down bone and to initiate normal bone remodeling. So essentially this drug class is slowing that process down. It's always going to be important to know with these big drug classes, their contraindications. It's a big safety, uh, safety thing. So it's important for going into boards, being familiar with these contraindications. So bisphosphonates, they are contraindicated in pac patients that have esophageal disorders, so strictures, varices, Barrett's esophagus, also if they are unable to sit upright for at least 30 minutes. Those are contraindications to this drug class. Uh, one more would be a kidney impairment with a creatinine clearance less than 30. These patients would not be taking the bisphosphonates. All right, so leaving osteoporosis, we're going to move on to some common orthopedic injuries. So first, we're going to talk about ankle and foot injuries. And as many of you probably know, I work in urgent care, and I see ankle and foot injuries all the time. So we have guidelines to help us determine when x-rays are indicated for both ankle and foot injuries. And those are, that's referred to as the Ottawa ankle rules. So plain radiographs or x-rays of the ankle are only going to be indicated for patients that have pain and tenderness to that malleolar zone. And if they're unable to bear weight, both immediately after the injury and for four steps on exam. X-rays of the foot are indicated for patients that have pain in the midfoot zone and have tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal or at the navicular 
or again if they are unable to bear weight both immediately after the injury and for four steps on exam. And the reason that we have all these sites for warning signs is because those are the most common sites for injuries and fractures to occur. Aside from a fracture, we know, of course, sprains can occur too. So fracture, of course, is affecting the bone. Sprain, now we're talking about an injury to the ligaments. Um, those, of course, are not able to be seen on x-ray. Those can be diagnosed clinically. Sometimes additional imaging like MRI is indicated for those as well. Generally, the rule of thumb is that both grade 2 and grade 3 sprains should be referred to an orthopedic, and so it's going to be important to be able to grade uh, a sprain injury. So they're graded 1 through 3 based on the severity of their symptoms and their presentation. A grade 1 sprain results from mild stretching of a ligament with microscopic tears, and patients might have my, uh, mild swelling, mild tenderness, there's no joint instability on exam, and that's going to be an important red flag in a question, no joint instability, that's a grade one sprain. They're able to bear weight and they're able to ambulate with very minimal pain. Grade two sprain, this is more severe. It involves an incomplete tear of a ligament. They have moderate pain, swelling, tenderness. They can have ecchymosis or bruising. There is mild to moderate joint instability on exam. They have some restriction of the range of motion and some loss of function. Weight bearing and ambulation now are more painful. And then finally, a grade three sprain. So this is a complete tear of a ligament. They have severe pain, severe swelling, severe tenderness, ecchymosis, so that bruising, bruising again, significant joint instability, loss of function, loss of motion, uh, not able to bear weight or ambulate. And so those are kind of how it progresses in the grading. Ankle sprains are a very common occurrence. They can involve both the lateral ligaments or the medial ligaments. Lateral ligament is the most common site for an ankle sprain. That is when the ankle inverts. That's much more of a common injury. Medial ligament, so where the ankle goes outward, that's ankle or ankle eversion, much more, uh, le it's much less likely, I should say, and it's more difficult and complicated to manage too. So if we're considering a medial ligament injury, th that automatically requires a referral to an orthopedic. So grade one sprains, they don't require joint immobilization. You can just use like an ACE bandage uh, or elastic bandage. That's sufficient. And then always RICE therapy with these types of injuries mainstay. So if you're not familiar, RICE is a mnemonic, rest, ice, compress, elevate. That is mainstay of treatment for all levels of injury. Grade two sprains should be stabilized um, with both an elastic wrap and either there's an air cast or a splint and then they should remain non-weight bearing until follow up with an orthopedic. Grade three sprains always are immobilized as well. They should remain non-weight bearing until follow up with orthopedic again. These patients uh, will likely require surgical intervention. Again, like I said, all of these patients also for the mainstay of treatment is RICE, so rest, ice, compress, elevate. I generally tell my patients that first 72 hours after an injury is the most beneficial for icing, uh, to use NSAIDs if there's no contraindications for short-term pain relief. Uh, also important is that with all orthopedic injuries, and I want you to do this with all of your patients going forward when assessing them, it's really important to make sure that they're both perfusing that limb adequately and that they are neurovascularly intact. And that's gonna be really important for you to assess and for you to document. When any injury to a limb occurs, they, there is a risk for injuring either a nerve or an artery that's supplying whatever that injured limb be. And so you wanna evaluate for sensation and perfusion by checking pulses, looking at their pigment of their skin, checking their capillary refill, all of those, like I said, are important not only during your assessment, for your, but for your charting as well.